Madam Registrar, to call the case, please. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors. This is the case number IT 942S, the prosecutor versus Dragon Nikolic. Very good afternoon to everybody. May I ask first, Mr. Dragan Nikolic, can you follow the proceedings in the language you understand? Yes, Your Honor, I can. May I then ask for the appearances? First, the prosecution, please. May it please, please your, um, uh, your, Lord, your Honours, uh, for the prosecution, the appearances self, Upo and Siapa, with uh, Ms. Patricia Sellers and Mr. William Smith. Ms. Diane Bowles is the case manager. Thank you, Your Honours. If it please, Your Honours, Howard Morrison leading Tanya Radosavljevic for the defendant, Dragon Nikolic. I think my microphone is on. Can you hear me? Before starting with the oral presentation of the judgment, I should like to thank all of you for your excellent cooperation and assistance during the last year. This goes not only to those appearing in the courtroom, but also to all those assisting us, but never being seen here. Technicians, translators, interpreters, guards, and all the other assistants behind the scene. On behalf of the entire bench, let me thank especially both parties. Without their professional presentation of their cases, we would not be able to sit here today. Personally, I want to thank the Chamber's legal assistants for their enthusiastic work and well-founded contributions to the now following judgment. Rosa Salibyekova, Lori Ibris, Jan Nemitz, and Courtney Massa. The following is a summary of the trial chamber's judgment, which will be made available in English, French, and BCS at the end of this session. The only valid version of this summary is the one that will be read out right now. This summary, however, forms no part of the judgment. The only authoritative account of the trial chamber's findings and of its reasons for those findings is to be found in the written judgment, copies of which will be made available to the parties and the public immediately following the hearing. The accused, Mr. Drakan Nikolic, also known as Jenki, a 46-year-old Bosnian Serb, was the first person indicted by this tribunal on 4 November 1994. A first amended indictment was confirmed on 12 February 1999 and contained 80 counts of crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and violations of the laws or customs of war. This case deals with his individual responsibility for particularly brutal crimes committed in the Susica detention camp near the town of Lazenica in the municipality of the same name. Dragan Nikolic was a commander in this camp established by forces, by Serb forces in June 1992. Already on 4 November 1994, arrest warrants for Dragan Nikolic were issued. Following the failure to execute the arrest warrants 
proceedings pursuant to Rule 68 of the rules were initiated on 16 May 1995. On 20 October 1995, the trial chamber issued its decision determining that there were reasonable grounds for believing that Dragan Nikolic had committed all the crimes in the indictment. The trial chamber stated that the failure to effect service of the indictment and to execute the arrest warrant was due to the failure or refusal of the then Bosnian Serb administration in Parle to cooperate. The accused was finally apprehended on or about 20 April 2000 by S4 and Bosnia and Herzegovina and immediately transferred to the tribunal on 21 April 2000. Mr. Dragan Nikolic pleaded guilty on 4 September 2003 to the third amended indictment which charged him with inter alia individual criminal responsibility for committing murder, count two, aiding and abetting rape, count three, and committing torture, count four, as crimes against humanity. The criminal conduct underlying these charges also forms the basis, in part, for the final charge of persecutions as a crime against humanity in count one. It has to be recalled that at the time of the accused's guilty plea, the commencement of his trial was already scheduled and the first witnesses had arrived in The Hague to testify in the form of depositions to be taken during the week of 1 to 5 September 2003. For a considerable period of time, during the pretrial proceedings, the trial chamber had to deal with jurisdictional matters. On 17 May 2001 and 29 October 2001, the defense filed motions challenging the jurisdiction of the tribunal based upon the alleged illegality of the arrest of the accused. The defense submitted that the allegedly illegal arrest of the accused by unknown individuals on the territory of what was at that time the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia should be attributable to S4 and the prosecution, thereby barring the tribunal from exercising its jurisdiction over the accused. S4 had arrested him on the territory of Bosnia-Herzegovina after he had been handed over by these unknown individuals. The defense further submitted that, irrespective of whether or not this conduct was attributable to the prosecution, the illegal character of the arrest should in and of itself bar the tribunal from exercising jurisdiction. On 9 October 2002, the trial chamber dismissed the relief sought by the defense. The trial chamber decided on whether the arrest of the accused and his subsequent transfer to the tribunal violated the principle of state sovereignty and or international human rights and or the rule of law. The trial chamber held that there was no collusion or involvement by S4 or the prosecution in the alleged illegal acts. The trial chamber held that S4 was in accordance with Article 29 of the Statute and Rule 59 bis of the rules obliged to arrest Dragan Nikolic and to hand the accused over to this tribunal. The trial chamber decided that there was no violation of state sovereignty in the current case and based its decision on three grounds. First, the trial chamber held that in the vertical relationship between the tribunal and states, sovereignty can, by definition, play 
cannot, by definition, play the same role as in the horizontal relationship between states. Second, the trial chamber recalled that neither S4 nor the prosecution were at any time prior to Dragan Nikolic crossing the border between the then Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and Bosnia and Herzegovina involved in this transfer. Third, the trial chamber held that in contrast to cases involving horizontal relationships between states, even if a violation of state sovereignty had occurred, the then Federal Republic of Yugoslavia would have been obliged under um, Article 29 of the statute to surrender the accused after his return to the then Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. In this context, the trial chamber recalled the maxim, dolo facit qui petit quod statim rediturus est, which means a person acts with deceit who seeks what he will have to return immediately. The trial chamber re-emphasized the close relationship between the obligation of the tribunal to respect the human rights of the accused and the obligation to ensure due process of law. The trial chamber held, however, that the fact assumed by the parties did not at all show that the treatment of the accused by the unknown individuals was of such an egregious nature that it would constitute a legal impediment to exercise jurisdiction over the accused. The defense filed an interlocutory appeal against this decision on 24 January 2003 following certification of the appeal by the trial chamber. The appeal was dismissed by the appeal chamber in its decision of 5 June 2003. First, the appeal chamber held that even if the conduct of the unknown individuals could be attributed to S4, thus making S4 responsible for a violation of state sovereignty, there was no basis upon which the tribunal should not exercise its jurisdiction in the present case. In reaching this conclusion, the appeals chamber weighed the legitimate expectation that those accused of universally condemned offenses will be brought to justice against the principle of state sovereignty and the fundamental human rights of the accused. Second, the appeals chamber held that certain human rights violations of such a serious nature that they require that the exercise of jurisdiction be declined. The appeal chamber concurred, however, with the trial chamber's evaluation on the gravity of the alleged violation of the accused human rights and found that the rights of the accused were not egregiously violated in the process of his arrest. On 2 September 2003, the parties submitted a plea agreement based on the factual basis of the new third indictment, which was accepted by the trial chamber at the plea hearing of 4 September 2003. A sentencing hearing was held between 3 and 6 November 2003, at which the prosecution called three witnesses and submitted the written statements of two victims and one expert into evidence. The defense called two witnesses and tendered into evidence written statements of three defense witnesses. Prior to the sentencing hearing, the trial chamber ordered proprio motu two expert reports, one on sentencing practices and the other on the socialization of the accused. During the sentencing hearing, Professor Dr. Ulrich Sieber of the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law in Freiburg, Germany, testified as an expert witness regarding the sentencing report, and Dr. Nancy Grosselfinger testified 
regarding the socialization report. The accused was given the final word. He made a statement expressing remorse and he accepted responsibility for his crimes. The trial chamber will now turn to a brief summary of the factual background. On or about 21 April 1992, the town of Lazenica was taken over by Serb forces consisting of the JNA, paramilitary forces and armed locals. Many Muslims and other non-Serbs fled from the Vlasenica area and beginning in May 1992 and continuing until September 1992, those who had remained were either deported or arrested. In late May or early June 1992, Serb forces established a detention camp run by the military and the local police militia at Susica. It was the main detention facility in the Vlasenica area and was located approximately one kilometer from the town. From early June 1992 until about 30 September 1992, Dragan Nikolic was a commander in Susica camp. The detention camp comprised two main buildings and a small house. The detainees were housed in a hangar which measured approximately 50 by 30 meters. Between late May and October 1992, as many as 8,000 Muslim civilians and other non-Serbs from Lazenica and the surrounding villages were successively detained in the hunger at Susica camp. The number of detainees in the hunger at any one time was usually between 300 and 500. The building was severely overcrowded and living conditions were deplorable. Men, women and children were detained at Chusica camp, some being detained as entire families. Women and children as young as eight years old were usually detained for short periods of time and then forcibly transferred to nearby Muslim areas. Many of the detained women were subjected to sexual assaults, including rape. Camp guards or other men who were allowed to enter the camp frequently took women out of the hunger at night. When the women returned, they were often in a traumatized state and distraught. By September 1992, virtually no Muslims or other non-Serbs remained in Vlasenica. The trial chamber recalls that the accused admitted the veracity of each and every particular fact contained in the third amended indictment that forms the factual basis of the plea agreement. The trial chamber also recalls that it is bound by the assessment contained in the plea agreement and the factual basis underlying that agreement, in this instance the third amended indictment. Regarding murder, Dragan Nikolic admitted his individual criminal responsibility for the killing of nine human beings. Durmo Hancic, Azim Ziljic, Rajit Ferhat Begovic, Muharem Kolarevic, Jevat Zaric, Izmet Cekic, Izmet Dedic, Meludin Hatunic, and Galip 
Muzic. Concerning the charge of aiding and abetting, rape, from early June until about 15 September 1992, Dragan Nikolic personally removed and otherwise facilitated the, the removal of female detainees from the hangar, which he knew was for purposes of rapes and other sexually abusive conduct. The sexual assaults were committed by camp guards, special forces, locals, local soldiers, and other men. Female detainees were sex sexually assaulted at various locations, such as the guardhouse, the houses surrounding the camp, at the Panorama Hotel, a military headquarters, and at locations where these women were taken to perform forced labor. Dragan Nikolic allowed female detainees, including girls and elderly women, to be verbally subjected to humiliating sexual threats in the presence of other detainees in the hunger. Dragan Nikolic facilitated the removal of female detainees by allowing guards, soldiers, and other males to have access to the, these women on a repeated basis and by otherwise encouraging the sexually abusive conduct. Regarding torture, Dragan Nikolic admitted to his individual criminal responsibility stemming from his criminal conduct in the torture of five human beings. Fikret Anaut, Siat Ambeskovic, Haryudin Osmanovic, Suat Mahmutovic, and Rejo Chakizic. Dragan Nikolic admitted to saying to the tortured detainees words to the effect of, but they did not beat you enough. If it had been me, you would not be able to walk. They are not as well trained to beat people as I am. And I can't believe how an animal like this can die. He must have two hearts. As part of the persecutions. Dragan Nikolic subjected detainees to inhumane living conditions by depriving them of adequate food, water, medical care, sleeping and toilet facilities. As a result of the atmosphere of terror and the conditions in the camp, detainees suffered psychological and physical trauma. The accused persecuted detained Muslims and other non-Serbs by assisting in their forcible transfer from the Raznica municipality. Most of the women and children detainees were transferred either to Klandani or Tserska in Bosnia, Muslim-controlled territory. The trial chamber will now turn to the sentencing law. A guilty plea indicates that an accused admits the veracity of the charges contained in an indictment and acknowledges responsibility, uh, responsibility for his acts. Undoubtedly, this tends to further the process of reconciliation. A guilty plea protects victims from having to relive their experiences and reopen old wounds as a side effect, albeit not really as a significant mitigating factor, it also saves the tribunal's resources. As opposed to a pure confession or guilty plea, a plea agreement, while, while having its own merits, 
as an incentive to plead guilty has two negative side effects. First, the admitted facts are limited to those in the agreement which might not always reflect the entire available factual and legal basis. Second, it may be thought that an accused is confessing only because of the principle do ut des, give and take. Therefore, the reason why an accused entered a plea of guilty has to be analyzed. Were charges withdrawn or was sentence recommendation given? In any event, a plea agreement does not allow the trial chamber to depart from the mandate of this tribunal, which is to bring the truth to the light and justice to the people of the former Yugoslavia. While treating plea agreements with appropriate caution, it should be recalled that this tribunal is not the final arbiter of history. For the judiciary, focusing on core issues of a criminal case before this international tribunal, it is important that justice be done and be seen to be done. When considering the appropriate sentence to be imposed in each case, the trial chamber emphasizes that the individual guilt of an accused limits the range of the sentence. Other goals and functions of a sentence can only influence the range within the limits defined by individual guilt. The trial chamber considers that the fundamental principles to be taken into consideration when imposing a sentence are deterrence and retribution. When combating serious international crimes, general deterrence refers to the attempt to integrate or to reintegrate those persons who believe themselves to be beyond the reach of international criminal law. Such persons must be made aware that they have to respect the fundamental global norms of sub substantive criminal law or otherwise face not only prosecution but also sanctions imposed by international tribunals. In the view of this trial chamber, retribution should not be understood as for fulfilling a desire for vengeance but solely as duly ex expressing the outrage of the international community at these crimes. Another main purpose of a sentence imposed by an international tribunal is to influence the legal awareness of the accused, the victims, the witnesses and the general public in order to reassure them that the legal system is implemented and enforced. Additionally, the process of sentencing is intended to convey the message that globally accepted laws and rules have to be obeyed by everybody. All persons shall be equal before the courts and tribunals. This fundamental rule fosters an internalization of these laws and rules in the minds of legislators and the general public. With regard to the applicable range of sentences, the defense in this case has raised the question of the applicability of the principle of lex meteor, meaning that if the law has been amended one or more times after the criminal conduct was committed, the law which is less severe in relation to the offender should be applied. The trial chamber notes that if the principle of lex meteor were to be applicable in the present case, the sentencing range would be restricted to a fixed term of imprisonment instead of a term up to and including the remainder of the convicted person's life. 
The Joint Chamber recalls that the principle of Lex Nietzsche is enshrined in Te Alia in Article 15, Paragraph 1, Sentence 3 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which reads, if subsequent to the commission of, a, of the offense, provision is made by law for the imposition of a lighter penalty, the offender shall benefit thereby. The trial chamber holds, however, that this obligation does not apply in cases where the offense was committed in a jurisdiction different from the one under which the offender receives his punishment. In the event of concurrent jurisdictions, no state is generally bound under international law to apply the sentencing range or sentencing law of another state where the offense was committed. The trial chamber finds, therefore, that it is not bound to apply the more lenient sentencing range applicable under the law of a Republika Sipska entity of Bosnia and Herzegovina. According to the statute, they have merely to be taken into consideration. In addition to an analysis of the range of sentences for crimes to which the accused has pleaded guilty, applicable on the states on the ter ter territory of the former Yugoslavia, and of the sentencing practice in relation to these crimes, the sentencing report provided by Professor Dr. Sieber also focused on the relevant sentencing ranges in the national jurisdictions of 23 other countries from all over the world. This overview shows that in most of these countries, a single act of murder committed by sustained beatings and motivated by ethnic bias attracts life imprisonment or even the death penalty as either an optional or a mandatory sanction. Apparently, based on this and on the United Nations general policy aiming at the abolition of the death penalty on a global level, the Security Council provided for imprisonment as the only sanction without any limitation and gave primacy to this tribunal also in relation to sentencing. The trial chamber now turns first to the gravity of the offenses and the aggravating circumstances only. The trial chamber finds that Dragan Nikolic's abuse of his position as a commander in Susica camp is a substantial aggravating factor. He abused the especially vulnerable detainees who lived and died by the hand and at the whim or will of Dragan Nikolic. Furthermore, the immediate and the long-term effects of the conditions in Susica camp aggravate the crimes of the accused. Not one single day and night as the camp passed by without Dragan Nikolic and others committing barbarous acts. The accused brutally and sadistically beat the detainees. He would kick and punch them and use weapons such as iron bars, axe handles, rifle butts, metal knuckles, metal pipes, truncheons, rubber tubing with lead inside, lengths of wood and wooden bats to beat the detainees. One of the most chilling aspects of these acts was the enjoyment he derived from this criminal conduct. The accused personally removed women of all ages from the hunger, handing them over to a man whom he knew would sexually abuse or rape them, and thereafter returned them to the hunger. As a result, women would have to agonize throughout the day, not knowing 
what was to be their personal fate in the coming night. The effects of Sushicha camp did not end once a detainee left the camp. Witnesses testified that they suffer psychologically from their memories to this very day. Furthermore, the number of victims is a serious aggravating factor. In conclusion, the child chamber accepts the following factors as especially aggravating. The accused, the acts of the accused were of an enormous brutality and continued over a relatively long period of time. They were not isolated acts, but an expression of systematic sadism. The accused ignored the pleadings of his brother to stop. He apparently enjoyed his criminal acts. The accused abused his power. He did so especially vis-a-vis -vis the female detainees in subjecting them to humiliating conditions in which they were emotionally, verbally and physically assaulted and forced to fulfill the accused personal whims in Taalia, washing and putting cream on his feet for his personal refreshment or having to relieve themselves in front of everybody else in the hunger. Due to the seriousness and particular viciousness of the beatings, the trial chamber considers the conduct charged as torture as being at the highest level of torture, which has all the making of de facto attempted murder. The detainees were treated rather as slaves than as inmates under the accused's supervision. Finally, the high number of victims in Susija camp and the multitude of criminal acts have to be taken into account. In conclusion, taking into consideration only, and I emphasize only, the gravity of the crime and all the accepted aggravating circumstances, the trial chamber finds that no other punishment could be imposed except a sentence of imprisonment for a term up to and including the remainder of the accused's life. There are, however, mitigating circumstances to which the trial chamber will now turn. The trial chamber will focus on four factors of special importance, namely the plea agreement and the guilty plea, remorse, reconciliation, and substantial cooperation with the prosecution. In order to make an assessment of the mitigating effect of the guilty plea, the trial chamber considered the country reports submitted by the Max Planck Institute and the jurisprudence of the international tribunals. In conclusion, the trial chamber accepts that a guilty plea should be taken into account for mitigation since it reflects the accused's acceptance of his responsibility for his crimes. The trial chamber notes that in most of the national jurisdictions surveyed, a guilty plea or confession mitigates the sentence. The trial chamber finds that the rationale behind the mitigating effect of a guilty plea in this tribunal includes the fact that the accused contributes to establishing the truth about the conflict in the former Yugoslavia and tends to foster reconciliation in the affected communities. The trial chamber recalls that the trial chamber, acting under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, has the task to contribute 
to the restoration and maintenance of peace and security in the former Yugoslavia. One prerequisite for this being to come as close as possible to truth and justice. The trial chamber accepts that remorse was shown during the sentencing hearing. In this respect, the trial chamber recalls that the accused declared in his final statement that he genuinely feels shame and disgrace. The trial chamber also accepts that the prosecution is satisfied that the accused's cooperation with the prosecution was substantial. The trial chamber considers these factors to be of some importance for mitigating the sentence, especially since the information about Susica and Vlasinica municipality was heard for the first time before this tribunal. Thus, the accused contributed to the truth and fact-finding mission of this tribunal. Considering all the above mentioned mitigating circumstances together, the trial chamber is convinced that a substantial reduction of the sentence is warranted. The trial chamber will now turn to the concrete determination of the sentence. The prosecution has recommended a term of imprisonment of 15 years. The trial chamber is, however, under the rules explicitly not bound by a recommended sentence specified in a plea agreement. Balancing now the gravity of the crimes and the aggravating factors against the mitigating factors and taking into account the aforementioned goals of sentencing, the trial chamber is not able to follow the recommendation given by the prosecution. The brutality, the number of crimes committed, and the underlying intention to humiliate and degrade would render a sentence such as that which was uh, recommended unjust. The trial chamber believes that it is not only reasonable and responsible, but also necessary in the interest of the victims, their relatives, and the international community to impose a higher sentence than the one recommended by the parties. The trial chamber is aware that from a human rights perspective, each accused, having served the necessary part of his sentence, ought to have a chance to be reintegrated into society in the event he no longer poses any danger to society and there is no risk that he will repeat his crimes. However, before release and reintegration, at least the term of imprisonment recommended by the prosecutor has in fact to be served. In conclusion, the trial chamber finds that the sentence declared in the now following disposition is adequate and proportional. May I ask you, Mr. Nikolic, please stand up. We, judges of the International Tribunal for the Prosecution of Persons Responsible for Serious Violations of International Humanitarian Law, committed in the territory of the former Yugoslavia since 1991, established by United Nations Security Council Re uh, Resolution 827 of 25 May 1993, elected by the General Assembly and mandated to hear the case against you, Mr. Dragan Nikolic, and find the appropriate sentence. Having heard your guilty plea, and having entered a finding of guilt for the crimes contained in counts 1 through 4 of the third amended indictment, hereby enter a single conviction against you, Mr. Dragan Nikolic, for count 1, persecutions, a crime against humanity, incorporating count 2, 
murder, a crime against humanity. Count three, rape, a crime against humanity. And count four, torture, a crime against humanity. We sentence you, Mr. Dragan Nikolic, to 23 years of imprisonment and state that you are entitled to credit for three years, seven months, and 29 days as of the date of this sentencing judgment calculated from the date of your deprivation of liberty, that is the 20th of April 2000, together with such additional time as you may serve pending the determination of any appeal. Pursuant to Rule 103C of the, of the rules, you shall remain in the custody of the uh, tribunal pending the finalization of arrangement for your transfer to the state where this sentence will be served. You may be seated. This concludes this sentencing hearing. All rise for your vulvae.